Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to prime grizzly bear habitat just outside of Dubois, Wyoming. This area is very high elevation with the valley bottom soaring to 7,000 feet high. The peaks to the south of town scrape the clouds at over 13,000 feet high and create a precipitation trap that keeps the valleys between lush and green. This is called orographic lift if you are interested in the scientific term. The forests here consist of pine, fir, and spruce trees mingled with stands of quaking aspen glittering their golden splendor each fall. Common animals here are antelope, elk, moose, and mule deer. Dominant predators in the area include black bears, bobcats, cougars, coyotes, and wolves, with the most ferocious of them all being grizzly bears. On the second day of October 2016, 59-year-old Lee Brook had been hunting elk with his brother-in-law, George Neal, and two other friends. Lee was the local Maytag repairman back in Westfield, Pennsylvania, where everyone knew him by his name. His longtime wife, Martha, supported Lee's hunting obsession and appreciated his sense of adventure. Lee was an avid elk hunter. He had ventured out for the past seven years and had great success, and this trip was no different. He had managed to bag a bull elk on opening day, but was forced to leave the carcass overnight due to the desire to avoid running into a bear while trudging through the dark. In the morning, Lee and his hunting buddies were heading back to recover the elk Lee killed the prior day. Lee's elk hunting season was over, so he left his hunting rifle back at camp and didn't pack bear spray. The only thing he carried with him was a serrated kitchen knife so that he could cut the carcass up to pack it out. Lee separated from the rest of the group as he was comfortable in the familiar area. As Lee approached the spot he'd left his elk carcass, he could see that it had been moved a short distance and was now covered in duff, sticks, and dirt. He knew this was clear sign that a bear had claimed his elk carcass. He also knew that when a bear claims a carcass, they will frequently lay down and guard it a short distance away. Now realizing that the bear may be too close for comfort, Lee turned around to see a dreaded sight. Off in the brush, the form of a very big sow grizzly materialized before his eyes. Strike one. Right beside her were her two cubs. That's strike two. A protective mama bear guarding an animal carcass she was claiming as food. That's strike three. Mother Nature doesn't always grant three strikes before and out. As soon as he saw the grizzly, Lee turned and began to run. He got about two steps into his panicked retreat when his motion suddenly stopped. The sow had stopped him in his tracks by biting into his backpack. In a motion too quick to avoid, the sow swatted Lee upside his head, knocking him out cold and sending him flying down the slope a few yards. While he was unconscious, the bear swatted and bit him for an additional 15 yards further down the hill until she had fully vented her fury. As he came to, Lee's vision was blurry and his head pounded as he regained consciousness. He could hear heavy breathing as the sow stood over him, and the whiskers of her muzzle brushing against his face brought Lee back to reality. As he lay there, a voice told Lee that he had to fight back. With all of his force, Lee struck out at the sow's face with his left fist and connected. Before Lee could pull his arm back for another strike, the sow bit into his forearm. Lee's right hand was still in his pants pocket. Before the sound knocked him out with her first swat, he was apparently reaching for the only defense that he'd brought, the kitchen knife. Now clenching the kitchen knife, Lee rose to his knees. He used the sow's grip on his left forearm to stay close to her as he plunged the kitchen knife into the side of her head repeatedly. The surprise and aggression of Lee's counterattack apparently terrified the bear. She turned and disappeared into the brush as Lee stood to his feet. He searched for her form in the brush, but couldn't seem to move or focus his eyes. No matter how hard he tried, he could only see the ground, but everything else was blurred by the blood in his eyes and the damage done to his face by the sow. Lee knew that he'd been beaten and battered by the bear, and that he had to get help quickly. He glanced around and could see his mustache and nose laying on the ground near the log he was laying against previously. 
He grabbed them and put them in his pocket before feeling his way on his hands and knees for forty yards around the hill. The short crawl exhausted Lee, and he crawled to the base of a nearby pine tree. He leaned back against the tree trunk and began to yell for help, hoping a member of his hunting party would hear his cries. As the desperation of his situation set in, Lee cried out, Lord, I could use some help right about now. Lee's brother-in-law, George Neal, heard his cries after a few hours and used them to hone in on Lee's location. As he approached Lee, he couldn't recognize the agonizing man in front of him. Where Lee's face used to be was a mass of blood and clots and torn tissue. Lee was missing his nose and nearly all of his upper lip, but incredibly, he was conscious and alert. George muttered to himself, Oh no, this ain't gonna be good. Judging by the dried black blood on Lee's clothes and face, George knew Lee had been there for too long already. He took off his shirt and draped it over Lee's shoulders to keep him warm. Lee wasn't in any shape to walk out, so a couple who were hiking nearby agreed to get help and hiked out toward the road. By the time the medical team had arrived to bring Lee to the hospital, he'd been laying on the mountain for seven hours. They transported him to a small hospital in Riverton, Wyoming, where his condition was stabilized. After doing what they could do for Lee, the hospital arranged for a medical helicopter to fly him to Swedish Medical Center in Inglewood, Colorado, for more intensive care. This is where Lee's luck turned for the better. A husband and wife team of plastic surgeons agreed to do what they could to restore Lee's face as much as they could. They had opened their practice only two weeks prior, but had all the experience, training, and education to remedy Lee's injuries. They immediately attached Lee's severed nose to his radial artery in his arm and buried it beneath the skin of his wrist. They used medical leeches to establish blood flow to it, but were unable to save his upper lip. During the medical examinations, it had been determined that the bear had crushed the entire left side of Lee's body during the attack. Nearly every bone in his face and skull had extensive damage. Lee's eye sockets were damaged, which explained why his vision was impaired immediately following the attack. His jaw was broken in multiple places, and the gaping hole left where his nose used to be was packed with dirt and twigs. Their first concerns were to stop the bleeding and clean Lee's wounds. Infection could set in and create a complication that may claim Lee's life, so removing all debris from his wounds was meticulously performed. They also did a skin graft from his leg to cover the hole in his face to prevent further contamination. Lee was given a 1% chance of living based on the severity of his injuries. The surgical staff put Lee into a medically induced coma for the first month of his recovery as they monitored for signs of infection and healing. Worried that Lee would be unsure of what he had experienced and react with anger, the doctors were relieved when he woke up and could see he was alert and thankful. Lee quickly garnered the nickname The Revenant from the nurses on his floor. Over the following three months, Lee would suffer through 12 surgeries, one of which lasted for 24 hours. Bones were taken from his lower leg and used to reconstruct his face, and cartilage was removed from his rib and used to reconstruct his nose. Metal plates that were implanted to hold his facial bones in place, affixed by screws, gave Lee an opportunity to joke that if he behaved oddly in the future, that he may actually have a screw loose. As if his physical injuries weren't enough, Lee also suffered from PTSD from the bear attack. He went from surgeries and physical therapy to mental therapy for most of many days. He had to learn how to eat again, among many other previously routine activities. His community back in Westfield organized a fundraiser to help Lee and Martha to offset the cost of his health care, and Lee's appearance garnered rousing applause. Following his injuries, Lee was unable to return to his appliance repair business and has been waiting to see what life will bring him and his wife. Martha expressed gratitude that Lee survived, stating that his injuries could have been worse. She says she would have been heartbroken with the loss of her husband and best friend. Lee's one regret is that due to the loss of his upper lip and the nerves in that part of his face, he will never again feel his wife's kisses. That is the biggest loss to him. In total, Lee and Martha spent years away from home as he had surgical procedures so frequently. The bear attack that nearly took Lee's life from him and her husband from Martha did nothing to stop their love of hunting. They still make hunting trips and enjoy their time in the woods together. 
As for the grizzly sow and her cubs, the only information I could find indicated that she weighed around 420 pounds, but no source indicated what came of her. I could find no mention of any attempt to kill or capture her, nor if she died from the wounds inflicted by Lee with the kitchen knife. It is assumed that she survived the wounds and continued to raise her cubs unaffected by further human intervention. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Do you think bear spray or a firearm would have made a difference in this attack? Do you think the cubs learned to attack human beings from what they observed their mom do to Lee? The next time you go for a walk in the woods, will you treat every large pile of sticks with at least a little suspicion? I know I will. I'll enjoy reading and replying to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.